Hey, well, good morning, everybody. What about that baptism? Come on. It's easy to preach after that. I'm going to go long because it was awesome. No. I uh, mean, just always want to highlight the value, importance uh, of baptism and just the reality that it's just the actual accomplishment of the mission that God has given us as a church to see lives transformed. We're a Jesus-centered, discipleship-driven, transformation-focused church. Amen. And so we just want to see lives change. That's why we're here. And so uh, if you're here and you're new, just thanks for joining us today. We are launching this new series, as Sean was sharing just a minute ago, on this idea of questions. And so let's all say the word questions together. Questions. Questions are really important. We answer a lot of questions every single day. Uh, We answer some that are important, some that aren't important. You know, I think the most popular question in the city of Atlanta, you know what it is, don't you? What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? That's the most important slaw dog and fo that all day long. Um, we we ask we answer questions. You know, maybe if you're married, you know, you answer certain questions um, from your spouse. I know that my wife asks me questions like, "Did you take the trash out?" Or do you see that stop sign coming? Uh, <laughs> that's how she asks questions. You know, as parents, we get we get lots of questions, don't we? Are we there yet? Is that the most popular question a kid will ask? Are we there yet? Well, of course not. That's why you're still in the car. How much longer? 14 hours longer for you. We're going to make you stay in the car. What about this one? Where do babies come from? You ever got that question? Like, ask your mother, right? That's how we answer that. We just have questions, and then you, you have more serious questions. You know, throughout life, you'll take different tests. And as you take tests, whether or not you can answer the questions right will determine whether you move forward or go backwards. Tests are really important. Uh, before I was in ministry, I was an actuary, and I was a professional test taker. So every time I would study uh, a couple hundred hours, three or four hundred hours even for a test, and then you take the test, and if you pass, you'd have to take it again. You got a promotion. You got a bonus. And if you didn't pass the test, you did have to take it again. You had to study all over again. And, man, test questions are really important. What about interviewing questions? Anybody ever had an interview with someone for a job and you had to get asked some questions and you prepared and you tried to guess and know what questions they were going to ask you because you wanted the job? Interview questions are really important. Lots of different questions in life that we have. But the most important questions are the questions that we get from God. Amen? Like the most important questions that we will ever face are the questions that we actually, that God asks us. And as we look in the Bible... We see that Jesus asks a lot of questions. Sometimes I wish he would just be clear and answer a few more, don't you? Sometimes I'm like, Jesus, couldn't you just tell us about this thing? Um, what about the dinosaurs? Like, come on. Um, but, but many times he asks questions. Jesus asks over 300 questions in his earthly life. And, and there's a reason for that. Do you think Jesus was looking for information? Do you think he's going to ask a question to somebody and they're going to answer? He's going to be like, huh, never thought of that. Jesus didn't ask for information, but his questions are an invitation for us to find the life that he wants. The the questions that God asks us, the questions that Jesus asks, the questions that we're going to look at over the course of this series are questions that God wants to use to transform our hearts and our lives. You know, Jesus asks us questions just to reveal our priorities, because sometimes it's only in the asking of the question do we really understand why we even do what we do. So it reveals our priorities. It also can redirect our path at times. I don't know if you've ever had this happen. Maybe you had a specific way you drive home every single day from work or from your kid's school. And then maybe one day you're going somewhere and it's kind of the same, but you have to take a detour to go to some other place. But you find yourself going the same place you always go because you're on autopilot. And and your wife or your husband's like, aren't you going to take that turn? Where are you going? What are you doing? Just because your mind, you're on autopilot. And this happens in life. We get on autopilot. We do the things that we know to do. We just keep doing the same things. We get caught in a rut and we miss out on what God wants to do in our life. So maybe if you're here today and you're just maybe spiritually unresolved uh, and you're just still trying to figure this thing out, maybe a friend invited you or maybe you just showed up so you could see a confetti can and go off in church because that doesn't happen anywhere else. Um, You know, if that's you today, what I would say is hopefully today there's some questions that, that will help you at least think about what are the questions that I need to be asking and answering in life. Hopefully it will just bubble up inside you the things that are important, the things that you've been looking for, the things that matter to you. You know, maybe you're just kind of lukewarm. You know the, you know the drill. 
You go to church, you maybe volunteer, give some money. You're a good person. You didn't, you know, you hadn't killed anybody at least this week. You know, I mean, and you're just kind of trying to just go through the motions. And hopefully today it will just be you get just encouraged and energized around this question of who Jesus is. And then finally, for some of us in the room who've been walking with Jesus for a while, hopefully today we'll be encouraged to ask this question to some people so that their lives can be changed. Amen? Amen? Come on. All right, so I'm going to jump in uh, right where she was, right where Caitlin was reading in verse 13 where it says that Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And, and, and what's really important here is something that we may, we may just skim past, and it's the location of this question. It's the context of the, this question. It's this place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, now, Jesus, just for context, at this point in his ministry, there's a lot of hostility going on. People are, people are after him because he's gaining a following and people are threatened. They don't know what to think of him. And so the religious leaders are plotting to kill him and it's about to happen in a few short weeks here as he uh, as we are into this scene now also uh, John the Baptist John the Baptist was the first he was the forerunner for Jesus he he paved the way for Jesus he has been executed and so Jesus takes his followers and they leave this hotbed of the Hebrew Israeli religion and they go a little bit north into this area of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus knows this may be his last chance to really sit down with his guys, with his followers, and give them the tools that they need and communicate something of real importance to them. So he takes them to Caesarea Philippi. It was actually a pretty hot vacation spot back in Jesus' day. It's not necessarily a place that we would go, uh, but they, they would, people would go there. It was just out of the hustle and bustle. It was out of the busyness of everyday life, and so people would go there, and Jesus takes them there. But not only that, it was a place of idol worship. So a couple of thousand years before Jesus shows up, there's Caesarea Philippi is this large, massive rock face. It's the tallest rock face in the nation of Israel. I think we have a picture of the rock face. You'll notice the cave down at the bottom. Now, that cave was actually for uh, the god Pan, who in that particular uh, culture, it was the pathway to the underworld. So this would have been the gateway of death right here. Like back and forth, as demons went back and forth, they just looked at, like, this is where death lived. Now, again, death doesn't live because death is dead, but you get the point. This is where death was active. This was the place, which brings some meaning to what Jesus says just a little bit later. Also, in the rock face were carved all these little edifices, these little carve-outs that were multiple temples, 14 different ones that people came to worship. And one of them was carved out for the Caesar of the day, who was known as the Son of God, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. So Jesus, needing to communicate this very important message to his followers, takes them there. And I think you can see why. Because he's going to ask them some questions, and now he's piqued their interest. He's stirred their curiosity. He's got it on their radar. He's made them aware of exactly what's going on in culture. Jesus knew that the time was right to settle the question about who he was. Powerful illustration. Now, now for us... We're like, that doesn't happen around here. I, I don't go anywhere where they've got shrines built to other gods. Like, Stephen, you come to my house. I've got no shrine in my house. Maybe your house is the shrine, huh? Maybe our titles are the shrine. Maybe our vehicles are the shrine. One of the ways to kind of un, unpack and to know what you worship is just to look at uh, th what I like to call triple A, three different A's. Number one is appetites. How we satisfy our appetites. This is how we get tempted. You know, in our culture, there's uh, some ways that are really way up at the top. Some maybe not as popular. But the first appetite, especially in our culture, is just sexuality. Hello, somebody? Right? We worship at the altar of sex. Man, it's used to sell everything from coffee to cars. It, it, it is promoted it's in front of us at all times on Instagram or Facebook. It's how they promote TV shows. I mean, you all, if you ever watch a show that you love and it's an action movie, there's going to be a what? A sex scene, right? Because this is one of the altars that our culture worships at. Um, appetites, another one is just whatever we consume. So think about all of the consumption that, that we get, the things that we buy. Can you say Amazon? Anybody bought anything on Amazon today, this morning, already? Like why, after the service started, anybody? <laughs> 
No, I was redeeming my gift card, Stephen. I know, I know. <laughs> and, and we consume and we buy. Again, is there anything wrong with buying stuff? No, absolutely not. But sometimes that is how we are looking for life. It's just through satisfying our appetites. So that's the first A. The second A is going to be um, is going to be ambition. It's going to be ambition. It's our, it's our desire to get ahead. It's our desire to succeed. It's our desire to what? Win. Our desire to win. We pass this on to our children, too. Can you say travel ball? That hurt, didn't it? Yeah, guilty as charged. Man, we, we, we put our kids in so many high-pressure situations. And, and you know that your child is going to be the next John Smoltz. I mean, you know it, right? They're going to be the one. The, they're going to be the outlier. They're going to be that percentage. They're going to be the best Hall of Fame pitcher in baseball or that great lacrosse player. And I would name a famous one, but I don't know one. Um, <laughs> which is why your kids play baseball, uh, or cheerleading, or soccer, or whatever. And we just put a lot of pressure on them to succeed. And, man, I'm all about team sports. I'm all about it. But, man, we, we build into our kids this idol of ambition. What about approval? That's the third A, approval, the idol of approval. Nobody in here really cares what other people think, do they? You don't care if people like you, do you? You just wear what you want to wear. You don't look at the styles out there. You just drive what you want to drive. You don't care what your neighbor's driving. You just live where you want to live. I mean, we all struggle with this idea of approval of other people. Like, while we may not worship an idol at a rock face with a, with a cave at the bottom, we, we've got some, and we got to root those out. Man, every day, God is looking at us by how we live our lives. He's looking at us to what we worship, but how we live our lives. Over in the book of Psalms, chapter um, 119, or 118, verse 24, it says this, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. See, we run a danger of not hearing the questions that God is asking us. And every morning when we wake up, God's saying, I, just, I created that sunrise, what are you going to do? I just gave you the time of the day. I just gave you 24 hours. I just gave you breath in your lungs. I just gave you people to talk to. I just gave you money to spend. I just gave you everything you have. Like, how are you going to deal with it? Man, are we going to answer the questions that God is asking? I mean, the context for us is our everyday life, and it's where we live. It's every day that we have, the 24-hour periods that we've been given. The Bible says this, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Another, teach us to pay attention to what we're doing so that we'll do the thing that we know we should do to follow you. And this is the context. Now, a question you can ask yourself is, am I pursuing a life that helps me hear God's questions? Am I pursuing a life that helps me hear God's questions? Am I just drowning out the questions that he's asking me? Do I even understand and know that he's asking me questions? Am I pursuing a life that allows me to hear God's questions? And then, you, of course, you have Jesus uh, Ask this question, who do people say the Son of Man is? And I just want to unpack this idea of the Son of Man and how, how these things get answered. So when Jesus asks this question about the Son of Man, that is his favorite title for himself. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man 88 times is, is what's recorded in the Bible. And now, the primary meaning of the Son of Man is talking about his humanity, that Jesus came to be with us. He came to be one of us. But, but, but beyond that, Jesus is using that term because he got it from the Old Testament. He got it from the book of Daniel. This is why the Old Testament is important because the Old Testament points to Jesus. Somebody say amen right there. Like the Old Testament has hundreds of prophecies that actually are for, fulfilled at a very low probability of, of it happening that gives us confidence and proof that Jesus is who he said he is. So in Daniel chapter 7, Jesus is looking towards this as he's using this phrase, son of man. And this is what is said in Daniel chapter 7. And again, remember, it will be about Jesus. Daniel said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, just meaning God himself who sees everything and has seen every day. He came to the ancient of days. He was presented before him. To him he was given dominion. And glory and a kingdom, and all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, 
which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. So Jesus is referencing the Son of Man like, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now he's hinting that he is that person, but he's also asking, what are people looking for? Now, now they give this answer um, about what everybody says in verse 14 when they, they say, and Peter kind of speaks for everybody. It says, they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So, so they give kind of the collective understanding of who Jesus is. Okay. Now start with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, as I said earlier, was the forerunner of Jesus. John the Baptist had been beheaded by the governor of the region. And so he was now dead, but some say he came back to life. They threw out Elijah. Now, now Elijah is a, what we would call a baller in our culture, man. <laughs> Elijah, man, he was on the Mount Rushmore of the Jewish nation. And lots of great stories about Elijah, but, but one that kind of caps it off. Elijah was so close to God that, that he didn't die. God just looked up down and said, it's time, and just took him into heaven. Like, this is Elijah. Some say you're Elijah. Some say Jeremiah, just this other messianic prophecy, and maybe another prophet. So there's this collective thinking about who Jesus is, and clearly, clearly this misunderstanding about who he is. No, they're not really sure what they can say who he is. This happens. It reminds me of a scene out of Braveheart. I get it. It's an old movie. Anybody seen Braveheart? Right? Classic but old. Classic but old. Now, now in that movie... You know, William Wallace just has this reputation that's run rampant throughout Scotland, even before anybody's actually seen him other than his few friends. And so he comes to the first battle, and he's running up and down um, the, uh, the battle lines, and, and it's just a bunch of farmers. I mean, all they've got it, to fight with is stuff they bought down at Lowe's and Home Depot. I mean, they, they don't have weapons, and so they're gathering there to fight. It looks like it's just going to be a bloodbath. They're going to get demolished. And so he shows up, and he says, I'm William Wallace. And one of the farmers says, you're not William Wallace. William Wallace is seven feet tall. And he says, I, I've heard. And he says, and if he were here, he would kill the English with fire from his eyes and lightning bolts from his, and you know what goes right there. I won't say it in church. But there's this misunderstanding. But then what happens? He steps in and he says, I am William Wallace. And see, this is where Jesus is going with this question. And I think for us, it has to paint the picture about, like, where do we get our understanding of Jesus? Like, where would you get your understanding of Jesus? If you begin to look around uh, in your life and to think through your life, like, where do you get your view of Jesus? How many people you got your view of Jesus from your parents? Right? Now, now, now here's the truth. Whoever raised you gave you a view of Jesus on some level. You know, for some people it may have been good and solid and they loved the Lord and they did the things that, you know, they should do to kind of prove that and live that out. For other people, maybe they didn't take you to church. Maybe they didn't talk to you about the Lord and maybe they didn't believe in God. They gave you a view of Jesus. Man, we're all given a view of Jesus a lot of times from our parents. Some of you, maybe it was a friend. Maybe they invited you to go to youth group, or they invited you to a young life camp, or maybe they invited you to go to uh, a Bible study, and you began to hang around them, and they walked with you, and you got your view of Jesus from them. It, you know, you, some, a lot of people get their view of Jesus from culture, which is very dangerous. Have you noticed? <laughs> Man, you get your view of Jesus from the news media that you feel like people who know Jesus are homophobic and transphobic and, you know, financial phobic and every other phobia in the world. And you see people stand on a street corner and they look angry all the time. And you have this view that that's who Jesus is. And we're just handed this view of Jesus. And we have to be careful of that because when, when our view of Jesus is shaped more by people on the outside than it is by the Bible, we're going to miss out on who Jesus is. Now, hopefully, if you've been here before, I've shaped your view of Jesus just a little bit. And everything I've ever said is right, okay? <laughs> of course not. I mean, I'm going to get some things wrong. I'm going to do my best. But, but we have to ignite, ask ourselves, like, where is it? Who shaped my view of Jesus more than anybody? Other religions can shape your view of Jesus. You know, there's a movement out now, and you're going to see some commercials today on at the Super Bowl called He Gets Us. Anybody seen these commercials out there? He gets us. Whole mission, their idea is just to recast and reorient people to see Jesus differently. Now, ironically enough, they're being criticized for all the money that they're spending on the ads. Wait, aren't your commercials going on the Super Bowl too? I don't know. It feels a little hypocritical to me. 
However, some people would say, you should spend that money feeding poor people. I'm like, you should spend that money feeding poor people. <laughs> and, and, and Jesus actually addressed this in a small vignette in his lifetime. Someone asked him. There was a, a lady who comes, and she has a very expensive bottle of perfume, and she washes his feet with it. And one of, the, one of his disciples said, man, she just wasted all that. We could have sold it and given it to the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always, but I will not always be with you. Listen, there is no greater way to spend money than helping people know Jesus. Come on. Right. And so today, maybe for you, if you see those commercials, maybe a way to leverage a conversation at your Super Bowl party with people who were there. And uh, they'll be completely not expecting it. And so, uh, but that is shaping how people see Jesus. Where do I get my view of Jesus? If you would have had to sit down and just start naming words about Jesus, what would you say? How would you describe Jesus? You know, friend, loving, warrior, angry sometimes, challenging, kind, truthful, disruptive, honest. I mean, Jesus, there's a lot of words that we could use to describe him, but if we never take the time to process how we see him, it's going to sabotage how we live. And then he asks, he goes on with question number two, which is even more important than question number one. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Ooh, makes it personal. Like this is the core issue of discipleship. Who do you say that I am? Listen, we have to get Jesus right or we'll get nothing right. We have to get Jesus right or we get nothing right, especially when it comes to discipleship. You know, there's the, the three names that have been given to Jesus. Either he's a liar and everything he said is untrue. He's a lunatic, he's just crazy, or he's Lord. Like, those are the options. I think Josh McDowell was the one who made those that popular. And so, so he asked them specifically, who do you say that I am? He knew their personal belief and not their parents' belief was what's going to matter. And I think we all have to do something with Jesus. Let me, let me just tell you why. It doesn't matter who you are, you're going to have to do something with Jesus. You know Why? Jesus has been on more magazine covers than Justin Bieber, Oprah, and anybody else in history. There's a marketing study done that if you want to increase sales of your magazine, put Jesus on the cover. Sales will go up 45%. You just have, you're going to have to do something with Jesus. Art, most art, the majority of art that's been produced throughout the ages, it has something to do with who? Jesus. TV shows, more money is spent on Christian causes than any, anything else around the world. And, and to top it all off, well, two other things. There are two massive holidays that we all celebrate, whether we believe in Jesus or not. Easter and what else? Christmas. Our year is built around Jesus. And every morning when you wake up and you look at your iPhone and you see the date, that date has predicated on the death of who? Jesus. Jesus, he divides history. you got to do something with him. You have to decide who he is and what you think. And your parents' faith is not enough. Your parents' faith is not enough. So many times we'll try to ride the coattails of our parents' faith. And you'll ask someone about their faith. It's like, my parents took me to church and, or, or whatever. And, and, and even some stories that maybe you heard today about people who are being baptized. That, it, it, that as children, parents took them to church they got baptized either as infants or as kids but now as they look back they're like ah oh, that wasn't my decision that was theirs and your parents were just trying to help you out so don't criticize your parents for that but there comes a point where you have to own it and you have to make your own decisions you have to own your own faith because when Jesus asks you this question he's not asking you about your parents faith not asking you about your friend's faith he's asking about your faith who do you say I am who do I say Jesus is who is he and so Peter, of course, be, oh, let me just make this point. Other religions all deal with Jesus. Let me, just, let me just make this point. It's really important. So Muslims believe Jesus was born a virgin, respected prophet, teacher, miracles, ascended to heavens, coming again. Baha'i believers believe that Jesus came from God, was a wise teacher, divine nature, worked miracles. Hindus believe Jesus was a holy man, a wise teacher, and a God. Buddhists believe that Jesus was enlightened and a wise teacher. And then even New Age believers maintain that he was, a, he, he was a good example, a wise moral teacher. And every religion deals with Jesus. You know, you know how many other faith leaders the Bible deals with? None. 
right? Don't have to because this is the truth. So Jesus has to be dealt with in our own life. And he just asks him a simple question. Then Peter says this. Now, Peter always speaks. If you've read the Bible, some of you love Peter because he's just like you, isn't he? He just, no filter. He just says what he's thinking. Love that guy. He's speaking for all the disciples because Peter was probably the oldest of the disciples. And so he's always the one who kind of speaks. That's why you see him front and center so much. So in verse uh, 15, Peter answers him. He said, but who do you say, uh, who do you say I am? And, excuse me, in 16, it says, Peter replied, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, that's a faith statement right there. Because they haven't, he, Peter hasn't seen him rise from the dead. So the fact that he's believing that he is the Christ is a faith statement. He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he says this really strange statement. He strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And so when Peter uses this term in verse 16, when he talks about you are the Christ, the son of the living God, they were all looking for a Messiah to show up. They were looking for a deliverer to show up. So Peter's saying, you came. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're everything that we had hoped for. Everything is wrapped up in you. And this is the same answer for us. If you're looking for life, if you're looking for the best life, you find it in Jesus. So Peter confesses that, and then Jesus just begins to lean into him a little bit. And notice that he gives Peter this name, Peter. Up until that point, his name was Simon. His name was Simon. Jesus changes more than just his name. Jesus changes his identity. You see, for us, names are just identifiers. Like when you think of what you're going to name, your, what you named your kids, or if you're expecting, you're thinking about what you're going to name your kid, you may have some hope of what it is, but, but honestly, honestly, you're just giving them an identifier so you can call them for supper. And some of us, you love your name. Some of you hate your name. How many people wish they had a different name? There's a couple. I would go for like Maximus or something, like wouldn't you? I want something better. But what this is teaching us, he gives him a new identity. He doesn't give him a task list to follow. He doesn't give him a bunch of rules to be different. And he gives him a new name. He gives him a new identity. And, and names are powerful. And he gives him a new name, a new identity. Listen, you cannot live beyond how you see yourself. You can't live beyond how you see yourself. One of, the reasons, one of the things I would always tell my kids when they were learning to drive, and I would say this in, the fr in front of other people, they're a great driver. <laughs> and I would say that because I wanted them to believe it, even if I maybe didn't, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but I wanted them to believe it. And I'll tell you what's mortifying to me is when I'm around talking to an, a parent and their kid walks up and they make a negative comment about their kids in my presence, I want to go, Jesus, turn the tables over on them sometimes. Because you're communicating a lot to them when you say that. I mean, words are powerful. And you've been told some words that you haven't been able to shake in all your years. You know, it could have been your parents, lazy, called you lazy, or a failure, or called you fat, or weak, or called you ugly, or dumb. And that's just kind of haunted you. It just kind of stays with you. And you've spent most of your life trying to prove them wrong, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm right, if I could guess, if I could bet. And words are powerful, and Jesus knows this. So Jesus calls him the rock. He calls him Peter. He gives him a new identity. Man, you can change a lot about you. You know, you can change your hair. You can change your hair color. You can change your hair length. You can get hair plugs. You can, cha you can change you can change your body type as much as you can. You can diet. You can work out. You can have surgery. You can get rid of some wrinkles on your face. Man, you can change your income level. You can change your spouse. You can change your house. But you can't change you. Only Jesus can change you. This is the beauty of the gospel. You get to be new. Man, he says, old things have passed away, new things has, have come. You get a new identity. Man, one of, one of my favorite movies, trilogy, is the Bourne series. 
Any, any, born, any born fans in the house? You have the born identity, born supremacy, born ultimatum. The others don't count, just so you know. <laughs> but in that, as you know, in the first episode, he can't remember who he is. So he spends time, the rest of the series trying to find who he is. And he gets clues all along the way, doesn't he? He gets clues all along the way, and he just begins to live into those, and he begins to follow those, and he begins to figure it out, and he begins to find out who he is. Man, th- th- there is an internal question that we're all searching for an external answer to, and that is, who am I? Jesus gives you a new identity when you begin to follow him. And however you've seen him, if you think he came to bring rules, you're, you're mistaken. If you think he came to bring a system, you're, you're mistaken. Jesus came to break down prison walls so that we could be free and we could be who it is that he's called us to be. Who do you say that Jesus is? He says, you are Peter. Peter means rock. And he says, on this rock, I will build my church. So he's saying rock as in like loose rock, like a building rock. But the rock he's building the church on is the foundation rock. It's the bedrock is what Jesus is doing. And so in the Greek language, there's this word play going on between these two names. So he gives Peter a new name, and it's positive, something strong. It's something all of us would want to be. And then he says this, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail, about, uh, sh- shall not prevail against it. So just a quick word. Now, now, this particular passage, just so you can understand a little bit about what Jesus is doing here, it, Jesus, um, when he says that he gives him the, he gives him the keys to the kingdom, and so he says, first of all, when he, when he makes Peter the foundation of the church, this is not him saying, hey, you're going to be the first in a long line of popes. This is not what he's doing here. Peter's very important, but he's not setting him up as the first of popes. Now, the Protestant response to that is, you know, those Catholics, they just got it all wrong. He's really just talking about Peter's confession of who Jesus is. It really has nothing to do with Peter. That's not right either, okay? That's an overcorrection. So what Jesus is doing with Peter, Peter literally is the foundation of the start of the church. Let me just explain it to you. In the first few chapters of Acts, Peter stands up and preaches the first sermon after Jesus has ascended into heaven. 3,000 people began to follow him. They were Jews because that was the first audience. So Jesus, so Peter preaches to the Jews. Then he goes to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. Peter goes and he commissions the Samaritans. This is all part of the Great Commission. Now, Samaritans and Jews did not get along. Man, there was this racial conflict that actually would make, some, make us blush about what's going on in our country. It was so intense. I and mean, there's a religious conflict. And so all of a sudden, Peter goes to them and says, the message is for you too. It was good news. And then in Acts chapter 10, Peter goes to a guy named Cornelius. Cornelius they ha- they ha- has a dream, or, and Peter has a dream. And he goes to Cornelius, and this is where Jews will give him permission to eat bacon. Okay, that, This is where Jesus... Peter comes along and says, you know what? The Lord has shown me that all these rules, that anything God has made is, is not unclean. It's clean, and we can eat anything. So Peter is the foundation. And here's what the message of Peter's life happens. Because after he goes to the Gentiles and he communicates that message, he kind of fades from the scene. And here's the beauty of what Peter has done. The fact that he is the foundation is that he has the what? Keys to the kingdom. Keys to the kingdom. Peter opens the kingdom of God to people who had been shut out and the keys are the gospel. Peter opens the gates, opens the doors to everybody. People who didn't think they could get in, people who had been shut out, people who had been prevented from coming in. Peter has the keys and the keys to the kingdom are the gospel. The door is open for everybody. The door is open for me. The door is open for you. The door is open no matter who you are or where you've been or what you believe. The door is open no matter if you think you don't know enough or do know enough, no matter whether you dress right or eat right, no matter whether you act right. The door is open. An open door is an open door, and we have the keys. Man, the keys to the kingdom. And Peter is the foundational apostle when it comes to that. The door is open for you. The door is open for you. Now, 
He closes out, after he gives him his new identity, he gives him this mission. And the reality is, we, we spend so much time, I just got to find my purpose. I got to find how I'm wired. I got to find the thing I'm supposed to be doing. If we would spend more time trying to find out who Jesus is than find out who we are, man, we would be able to step into the mission God has created for us and the purpose that God has for us. Now, now he closes out with this verse, and I pointed out earlier. It says, he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was a Christ. Now, didn't that seem opposite to what everything else Jesus said? Like the Great Commission, go and tell everybody. Why would he tell people not to, not to say anything? And, and here's why. They wanted Jesus on their terms. They, they, they were expecting a military conqueror to come in and to open the gates wide for them. For them. They wanted it on their terms. But Jesus comes and establishes the church. And notice it says this. The church, even the gates of hell can't overcome that. Now remember, they're looking at the gate of death right there. And Jesus is saying, even that can't prevail. Listen, the church goes marching on. The church goes marching on. Is this quote from Mark Twain. He said, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. The reports of the death of the church are greatly exaggerated. Man, every generation someone comes along and says, we're too sophisticated for that. We don't need that anymore. And what happens? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The church continues to march forward. Listen, the church is the hope of the world. Jesus established it when he came here. And he established it through the gospel. And this is what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to conquer militarily. That's happening later. But that's what what everybody wanted then. And so Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody because they're going to want to, they're going to just want me to fill their agenda. And he wasn't going to do that. He had his own agenda and it was to build the church. Ultimate question God asks us is, who do you say I am? And we have this same tendency to want to get, ask God to fit into our plans. Anybody do that? Make some plans. God bless my plans. Don't let me fail. Man, make it work, Please. And we're so busy making our own plans, we don't hear the God, God asking us the question, who do you say that I am? Who am I? And just like they, wanted, they had an agenda for God, we have an agenda for God. And listen, God loves us, but his agenda is way better. His agenda is way better. And when Jesus asked this question, he didn't want to just, us to just answer with our lips. He wants us to answer with our lives. That's why he gave Peter a new name and a new identity. He made him a new person so he could live a what? A new life. Man, Jesus is the river of life that will never run dry. He's a bread of life that will always satisfy. He's the king of kings that should always be worshipped. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Man, he is the Messiah. He is everything that you've ever been looking for. And he asks you for your life today. Who do you say Jesus is? Let's pray together.